Thank you. And our last speaker before our robust discussion is Natalie Cote from Toronto General Hospital, and she will speak on non-pharmaceutical approaches to pain management. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me over to give me the opportunity to speak about this today. So I'll be discussing a non-pharmaceutical approaches to pain management. Um, there's a lot of different options available. I won't be able to discuss all of it in uh, eight minutes, but we will be discussing some of them. Most of the research that I've looked at was uh, based mostly on thoracotomies. As we know, ice has been used for centuries. We use it a lot at home, emergency first aid. It is used a lot in orthopedic surgeries, and it can be used as well for thoracotomy and acute pain. We know that at least 20 minutes of ice time is the most efficient to be able to get the pain relief, to get vasoconstriction and decreasing of uh, inflammation. And we need at least 30 to 40 minutes between sessions to be able to prevent any injury that could happen to the tissue. Thoracotomies are usually involved with chest tubes, and chest tube removal can be quite painful. They have found that icing for at least 20 minutes prior to chest tube removal can decrease the pain significantly. It is also quite effective when sternal incision pain is present as well. Cold application can contribute to pain caused by chest tube removal, and if you're combining cold with relaxation techniques, um, that could actually help as well with the coronary bypass grafting patients. Imagery relaxation techniques can vary between um, just sitting down, having listening to music, to focusing on just meditation and going into your breathing techniques. And they have come to be quite effective, um, especially when combined with ice. And it can assist with decreased anxiety and muscle tension. As we know, pain increases anxiety. Anxiety increases pain. So as we relax, we're able to reduce or possibly reverse the sympathetic response to pain. We're dropping the oxygen consumption, the blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate can all be normalized if we're able to relax efficiently. Music therapy has been studied. Um, this is a study that was done with 30 minutes of music therapy for three days post thoracotomy, day one, two, and three they found that 68% of patients felt less pain and 76 of them felt less anxiety and they both work together. So can, it can be um, effective when, relieving, when releasing some painful procedures, not necessarily all. It, could, it may be effective for chest removal if we combine it again with ice. Now you'll have your better results. Physiotherapy is and can be, most, for most thoracotomy or most thoracic programs, there's a physiotherapist on board. Get them involved as soon as, we po as possibly. Um, that way we can prevent shoulder dysfunction, which could lead to frozen shoulder, and then long-term uh, issues further on. We can help with early mobilization, chest therapy, and septus parameter, and increase the outcomes post-surgical. Early mobi mobility can help with exercise prevention. We, we can help with adhesions and allowing scar. Early mobility can start from the second they're out of the OR, um, whether they're on ECMO, they're still intubated. We need to get them moving as early as possible because it by staying in bed, patients get very anxious about the, their first visit with the physio. Anxiety increases pain. If we can get them going, they're like, this is routine, you're totally fine, and then get that going, we av avoid that fear. And by getting them moving, they are able to breathe deeper breaths, able to produce secretions, start coughing, and actually get them extubated as soon as possible if they are not already there. And acupuncture as well um, has been studied greatly in, in the East trying to catch up a little bit in the West. Um, acupuncture can depress pain by activation of muscle neurotransmitters. 
which may activate endogenous pain inhibitory pathways. Electroacupuncture alleviates pain by triggering the release of bioactive chemicals and that block pain through the peripheral, spinal, and supraspinal mechanisms. A lot of the studies have, sh have suggested that electroacupuncture can help reduce side effects from pharmaceuticals, and there was significant difference in the randomized control trial versus the um, acupuncture group versus the control group in 20% reduction in analgesic post thoracotomy population. The meta-analysis reviewed showed there was a significant drop in opioid use um, with the electroacupuncture group compared to the the control group, again, for the thoracotomy population. And there was also a significant drop in PCA morphine with the use of acupuncture. I am able to use acupuncture in my setting. Um, we often use it with the post-lung transplant population. I've had patients who, on first post-op day one, pain from 9 out of 10, would refuse to move, couldn't take a breath because of so much pain, agreed for a 20-minute session of acupuncture with a few points. 20 minutes later, their pain drops from a 9 to a 3. We're able to get them up, take them for a walk, sit them in the chair, pass their SBT, and get extubated that day. If we weren't able to use that at that point, they probably would have gotten a little bit more analgesics, decreased LOC, and more side effects that could occur and probably have a longer stay in the ICU, potentially a longer stay in the hospital. So in summary, uh, non-pharmaceutical pain management can be effective if started early. It can be started immediately in PACU or right in the, as they, they get delivered to the ICU, icing immediately at the chest tube sites or the sternal area. It can be simple and inexpensive options to reduce the pain immediately, and early mobilization um, has the potential in preventing other shoulder dysfunctions and progressing the discharge home. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you all. Outstanding lectures. Great speakers. I open the floor now to anyone who has any questions. Please come up to a microphone. Dr. Gerdish, if you can come up and join us at the stage, I'm going to kick off the first question to you and also to Dr. Grant. So uh, let's start talking about uh, intraoperative anesthesia. So um, did you, Dr. Gerdish, did you decrease the amount of opioids used at the time of surgery? And the reason I'm asking is there's something called opioid-induced hyperanalgesia, and maybe that can explain a lot of the decreased pain you see post-op. And then my second question to Dr. Grant was, can we just blame the anesthesiologist for most of this post-op pain? I mean, let's just, you know, we're mostly surgeons in this room. Why don't we just band together? What are your thoughts about that? Dr. Gerdes first. Uh, so we did, and it was primarily driven by wanting to extubate in the operating room, and we recognized that the thing that differed between anesthesiologists who were successful or weren't were the ones that were using more opioids, so it was all taken down to 100. That was the max. And, uh, and anecdotally, we had a guy that came from a university program, and uh, at first, like, couldn't even fathom doing what we were talking about, and then he did, and now he loves it, right, because he can activate in the operating room. So uh, I think that uh, it's true that we have to get a, a handle on it from the minute the patient comes in the door. Yeah, and then a um, couple things. So I would blame the anesthesiologist because we're the only ones really paying attention during the course <laughs> of the <practice. laughs> um, but, but all joking aside, so your notion about opioid-induced hyperalgesia and then and actually opioid tolerance happens quite quickly. So just a single dose of opioids can induce tolerance, so you'll need a, an escalating dose of opioids for the next administration. And then hyperalgesia is really interesting because what will happen is you'll go and treat a patient for pain and you'll actually induce more pain paradoxically with opioid. Happens all the time with our shorter acting synthetic opioids, so that's the sufentanyls, fentanyls, and remifentanyl is the biggest one. Um, and so we've removed remifentanil entirely from our cardiac surgical population for this exact reason. Dr. Rohr. Hi, Rick K. Shavar, University of Hospitals in Cleveland. I have a couple questions for you. Um, first, many of you alluded to the issue of looking at the patient preoperatively and how you prime that psychological pump, as it were, to be prepared for surgery. And Dr. Clement, maybe I'll start with you first since you alluded to 
a brochure that, that you've used, maybe Mark as well. And the second question to what Mike just spoke about with regards to hyperalgesia, what's the best bedside tool other than just seeing what happens to patients to assess for that, that our nursing team can look at to assess whether it's ineffective or not? Thanks. Thank you for that. Good yeah, thank you for that question. So I think the reason why the Michigan study was so useful is I think of all states, I think Michigan's probably one of the most proactive in addressing this. So a part of state law, if you actually look into it, I trained, I did not train at the University of Michigan, I went there for undergrad, but they have a basically a requirement that you put in the medical record. If you prescribe a patient opioid, it's actually required counseling that you put in the medical record that you sign and the patient signs. And that's a part of it, so it's actually regulated. And they have a Michigan opioid prescribing network, and that's how they made these recommendations. So I think it's a lot of it state driven, and that's why it's a big issue. Um, I'm happy to share that screenshot of the discharge opioid recommendations with anybody. It's really easy, it's really simple. You can put in your perioperative care pathways. It's already been validated. So I think that's a really good option um, for sort of getting this issue under control. So. And then to speak real briefly to the um, hyperalgesia question. Um, so one very quick bedside way to determine if it's hyperalgesia or not is to actually um, elicit pain or, or just stimulate an area outside of where you'd expect pain to occur. So for example, if you give a fentanyl or some equivalent and they don't have pain either at the incision site or a chest tube site or their backside where they've been sitting all day, they have pain in an alternative location, that is very likely a sign that hyperalgesia has been induced. So it's one very quick way to do it. The last thing to say is every patient before they undergo surgery really should have their expectations set, right? So that conversation seems rote, but what we have traditionally done is said, oh, it's going to be great, you won't have any pain. And just the simple statement of, by the way, surgery is painful, but we will get you through it, is as simple as it sometimes needs to be to elicit at least a little bit more trust within the patients. Hi, Quinn Ficus from Las Vegas. Uh, this question is for Dr. Gerdish. In, in terms of uh, rigid fixation, um, have you been doing this long enough to kind of know what your, your treatment was going to be for patients who come back and have redo operations? How do you deal with that? Uh, sure, it's a great question. We have been doing it long enough. We've been doing it for several years. So um, the two scenarios are rushing back into someone's chest uh, and then just a re-op, right? So I've had both. Uh, re-op is no big deal. You just open up, you take the screws out, and you can reuse the plates at the end of the case. So it's a re-op you do three or four years later for some reason, uh, you can just take, use the plates again. For, in the acute setting, uh, you just have to make sure that on the unit uh, you have the big uh, clippers that are dual action uh, because you need to uh, and also do that first before you take the wires out because we use wires to pull the bone together. But you need to get through each of those before you can open the chest. I've had to do it twice, both people survive. So I think that uh, that's a good enough record for me over several years. I think that the, the excuse that some people use, it's hard to get back in the chest or whatever, I think that's baloney. I think you just have to be ready to do it. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. What do you do for the patients that are with the BMI of over 40? You said that was surgeons. Right. So actually, that, I changed that chart because it used to be that they were, from my partners anyway, they were just keeping them in the red category. But then they saw that I was ignoring that. And uh, we just have gone to everybody is sternal green. So a BMI, even of, I've had people 55, 60 BMI where, uh, where we just let them use their arms. And they need it more than anybody else. And that's why they get to go home instead of go to an extended care facility, because they can use their arms, get out of bed, and do a, get up and down from the toilet, that kind of thing. Uh, Jeff Jaffar, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, this is for Julian, and, and other panelists can kind of co comment. Um, you'd mentioned the cryo. Uh, are you using that for your minimally invasive thoracic procedures? Uh, in my, I, my experience, we've done it on our thoracotomies and our transplants. but. Are you, are you using on your minimally invasive and are you combining that with your liposomal bupivacaine gain or other things like that? Yes, thank you for the question. <clears throat> I'm routinely applying the uh, expiral uh, mix uh, up front as the first step. Uh, and then depends on the, uh, of the approach. If it's a VATS operation, if it's a wedge where I'm gonna be waiting for frozen section to come back, then while I'm waiting for that, I do the uh, cryo of the involved intercostal spaces. I try to do no more than four spaces, particularly because the lowest one tends to be around the eighth intercostal space. 
and we don't recommend uh, freezing below that level because otherwise the abdominal musculature gets weak and they have this bulge. Uh, with robotics, it's a little bit different because we aim at putting all the ports on the, along the atheroncostal space, so I shrink it to three spaces, seven, eight, and nine. That has minimized the actual bulge from the abdominal wall but has provided pretty good analgesia. So yes, everybody, and especially the thoracotomies, two above, two below, I think that has proven to be very effective. Thanks. Dr. Ward, you have a question? I was wondering if the panel could discuss chest tube type and chest tube duration and how that impacts post-op pain. Well, I could take a stab at the beginning. Uh, just recently downsized about a year from uh, ago from uh, the typical 28 French to 24 concerned with some of what I had been taught that, you know, it may get clogged or plugged and not resolve the, uh, the pneumothorax or the ongoing air leakage. But so far, with a year of a smaller tube, I have seen significant improvement in the discomfort, particularly in smaller patients. But I have not had any trouble with uh, tubes getting uh, plugged or anything like that. So downsizing on the softest um, um, chest tube is, has been proven I would add that um, we use, I use cryo intercostal block for all the minis, and that has been absolutely revolutionary. In the slides, there's a slide that first showed that we eliminated opioids completely for the minimally invasive valves. Uh, but we also apply cryo directly into and on the nerve space where the chest tube will be, because that was the one thing that they were still complaining about. So that, I think, has been a really important thing. Uh, we have gone down in size too, but we use active chest tube clearance for every patient too. So it's a little bit different in the sense that the caliber isn't very important to us. So quick question for the two of you who have mentioned cryo. So there's some data that brings a little pause to some people who are maybe not as familiar with cryo that there's a component of potentially chronic pain that's induced by the use of cryotherapy. And I wonder if you guys have a follow-up program or have a sense of whether that's been an issue for your patients. Um, super important because uh, we do have extensive follow-up, and believe me, if a patient's having any pain, I want to know about it, and they know to call me. All my patients have my cell phone number. I would know. Uh, but having done hundreds of cases, I've not had anybody with persistent, long, you know, allodynia, chronic pain. I do do it a particular way that people, not everybody does it, but it has been incredibly effective up front. I do tell them ahead of time that during, it'll take eight to ten weeks for them to get their sensation back, and during that time, they'll feel some... Uh, pinpricks, needle sensations, weird sensations as the nerve recovers, but we've had nobody come back with chronic pain. I agree with that, and uh, from my standpoint, uh, it is important to keep in mind that 15% of thoracotomies will develop post-thoracotomy post syndrome, and that's this chronic neuropathic pain that lasts a year or, or longer. And minimally invasive is not very different. It's lower at about 8%, uh, some estimates. So the big question is going to be, was that neuropathy resulting from the cryo, or was that patient developing a post or post thoracotomy syndrome anyway? Very difficult to distinguish, and I think that's enough to give some surgeons pause. Uh, but like in his experience, I have not encountered a patient that has had uh, a, a permanent neurological damage. And I do exclude patients that come in with the use of narcotics pre previous to the surgery, or anybody that has a, a complex regional pain syndrome, anything that all is related to pain, I do not offer cryoanalgesia. Dr. Salinger. Hi, Ron Salinger from Baltimore. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Very informative session, uh, especially Mark, because now I know where to send all my patients with a BMI <laughs> over 50. <laughs> uh, my question is NSAIDs, the uh, black box warning for patients with coronary artery disease. Does the panel think that that is warranted? And if it's not, can we change it? So I'm not going to be quoted on what I'm about to say, but I will say that that data is based upon some studies that were, we'll call them historical studies. And there is an association. It's a strong association, actually, and it was in coronary artery bypass grafting. So the FDA black box exists. I will also point out that there's black box warning on almost all of the drugs that we use on a regular basis, and yet we still continue to use those drugs probably against the black box warning. That is not to say that you should go out and use NSAIDs for everybody. In fact, I think Dan would probably agree with me that the risk for NSAIDs in this patient population is particularly high because of the rate of AKI that occurs with these patients. That all being said, we do use it strategically at our institution, not universally. 
um, but particularly as a second line agent for patients that have uncontrolled pain, it can be a genuine game changer, provided that you have all of the standardized checks and balances in place to make sure that their kidney function is not appreciably infected. Last thing I'll say is, NSAIDs do not change the rate of bleeding, period. They just don't. So if anybody says that they do, that's just not true. Our last question. Hi, Ankur Bakshi from San Diego. Um, there are a number of blocks in the literature for sternotomy pain management, and one that we've used is the pecto intercostal fascial block with ropivacaine. And one thing that I've noticed, post-op day zero, it's great for getting them extubated, great for getting them in the chair. Post-op day one in the morning, they're walking. And then the afternoon of post-op day one, they start slumping and getting pain to the point where we've talked about reblocking on post-op day one. Do you have any recommendations for either extending the effectiveness of the block or something of that nature? Yeah, this is a great question. So I favor that block too. That's what I use in all my, for my practice at Johns Hopkins. So that's, that's what we use for our patients. Um, we get the exact same impact. So somewhere in that eight to 16 hour range. Um, the best studied medication for extending its duration is dexamethasone, um, either in the block itself or, ironically, we, there's a really interesting study that's shown that you can give it intravenously and it will extend the block despite the fact not being part of the additive, which is kind of interesting. Um, there have been head-to-head -head comparisons between liposomal bupivacaine and straight bupivacaine or ropivacaine, and unfortunately, we haven't seen an appreciable difference in the overall block duration. It's probably owing to the fact that there's just a different um, consistency to the slurry that gets created by the liposomal bupivacaine. So we may find a technique that makes sense for that, but what we've gone to when we need to is to redose the block, and I think that that's probably the best option. That, in addition to getting all of your multimodals on, one challenge that we have had is that you do the block, you get great block, you get great pain control, and then the patients don't want pain medications. That's admirable, but it's probably appropriate to keep that scheduled non-opioid armamentarium in the background so that they don't get into extremis when it wears off. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, this concludes our session. On behalf of my co-moderator, Dr. Ward, we'd like to thank all the speakers for outstanding, timely, up-to-date talks and the audience for their attention and outstanding questions.